next session, we are pleased to present to you a panel discussion on the landscape of space standards. So welcome everyone to our uh, discussion of uh, the landscape of space standards. I'm uh, Marlon Sorge. I'm a principal engineer at the Aerospace Corporation. I've uh, worked on space degree and space safety for over 30 years now. And uh, I've been involved in a number of uh, standards and uh, guideline development, uh, including uh, the ISO Orbital Degree Working Group uh, and the uh, Interagency Space Degree Coordination Committee. As uh, I'm sure everybody has noticed, uh, the whole uh, way that uh, space is being done, all the going on, are radically changing. Uh, we're seeing uh, all sorts of new space missions from uh, on orbit servicing to constellations of hundreds or thousands of satellites to an enormous boom in uh, small satellite usage, which has uh, significantly expanded uh, the democratization and commercialization of space, uh, which also parallels the growth that's going on in requirements for national security and civil space. So just an enormous amount of change going on all across the board here. Uh, it opens up a lot of opportunities, uh, all sorts of exciting things that can go on, uh, it also brings up a number of challenges and uh, really pushes the need for uh, trying to produce uh, good sets of standards and best practices. It'll assist the, uh, the new entrants that are coming in. Uh, it'll encourage everybody to follow good practices, which is critical in space because we all share space together. Uh, a problem for one uh, can quickly become a problem for all. And uh, the use of standards can help uh, in, uh, encourage confidence of users in the new space services that are coming online. So uh, we are going to have an interesting discussion on the issues of, uh, of current space standards. What does the landscape look like now? What do we need to do to help facilitate this uh, new age of uh, uh, space activity? So I'd like to introduce uh, the two panelists. Um, the first is uh, Dan Trogi, who is the Director for uh, Space Standards and Innovation, uh, Director of Integrated Operations, and Space Policy Expert at uh, Commercial Space Operations Center. Yeah, and I would also like to introduce uh, Jim McCabe, who serves as a Senior Director uh, for uh, Standards Facilitation at the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, where he directs collaborative standardization activities for emerging technologies. Great to be here. Thanks, Marlon. Thank you to the Space ISAC and Aerospace Corporation for inviting ANSI to be part of this discussion of the landscape of space standards. I'm going to talk a little bit about the U.S. standard system to get us started. The U.S. system is market-driven, it's flexible and sector-based, it is industry-led and government-supported, unlike other economies around the world where the government dictates standards. It emphasizes private sector standard solutions and supports broad stakeholder engagement. Ultimately, it allows stakeholders to find the solutions that best fit their respective needs. This is all outlined in a document called the U.S. Standard Strategy, currently under revision. In the U.S., no single government agency has control over standards. It's up to each agency to determine which standards meet its needs. The National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act of 1995 encourages each government agency to seek out private sector standards that are appropriate for its purpose and mission, whether that's rulemaking or procurement, whenever possible. The Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, has the legal responsibility of implementing the NTTAA, and additional guidance is provided in OMB Circular A119. Standards should meet societal and market needs and not be developed to act as barriers to trade. The U.S. endorses the globally accepted standardization principles of the World Trade Organization's Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement. These principles align with those contained in ANSI's essential requirements for due process, openness, and consensus in the development of American national standards. There are different models of forums in which to develop globally relevant standards. Examples of these include national participation models, where there is one country, one vote, 
treaty organizations such as the International Telecommunications Union or non-treaty organizations such as ISO and IEC based in Geneva, Switzerland follow that model. There is also the direct participation model. Some of the US-based standards developing organizations that have international meetings and international participation follow this model. This model has technical experts writing standards from start to finish. There is no national body voting. It's the individual experts who determine the final content of the standards. And then there are consortia. Examples include Open Geospatial Consortium and CONFERS in the space area. And these are groups that get together to write standards around a particular technology area or platform. So all of these models are embraced in the U.S. standard strategy as what we call the multiple path approach to achieving globally relevant standards. For its part, ANSI has been around since 1918. We're a private nonprofit membership organization, and our mission is enhancing U.S. global competitiveness and the U.S. quality of life. And we do that by promoting, facilitating, and safeguarding the integrity of the U.S. standard system. We serve the diverse interests of more than 270,000 companies and organizations worldwide. These include businesses, professional societies, and trade associations, in many cases of which act as standards developing organizations, as well as government agencies, con consumer groups, and more. We're the sole U.S. representative to the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, and via the U.S. National Committee, the International Electrotechnical Commission, or IEC. We have many roles. I'm going to focus on our role in offering a neutral forum for discussing standards, needs, and priorities. Again, ANSI itself doesn't develop standards, but one of the things we do is accredit standards developing organizations, which can then write or submit candidate American national standards for approval by ANSI as American national standards. We're all about due process. We don't get into the technical merits of a standard in approving it as an ANS. We also accredit and approve U.S. technical advisory groups, or TAGs, which serve as mirror committees for ISO and IEC technical work. And in many cases, we administer or delegate TAGs and U.S. secretariats. Uh, we do that in the space sector. In the case of ISO TC20 SC13, in which the U.S. Uh, secretariat is held by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and SC14, the Secretariat of which is held by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Ultimately, we serve as a bridge between the U.S. public and private sector, and we're all about ensuring the integrity of the system. Because we ourselves don't develop standards, we can serve in the role of neutral facilitator in a way that others cannot. We typically will convene either one-off workshops or ongoing collaboratives when there are national or global priorities or in areas of emerging technologies. And these groups are all about promoting the development and compatibility of voluntary standards and related conformity assessment or compliance programs. So again, it's about coordinating public and private sector, identifying existing standards, those standards that are in development, and related conformity assessment programs, defining where gaps exist based on stakeholder needs. When we identify a gap, we recommend additional work that's needed, timelines for its completion, and organizations that can perform the work. All of this helps to inform resource allocation for standards participation, avoids duplication of effort, and drives coordinated standards activity. This slide shows a number of the standardization collaboratives that we have uh, convened over the course of many years. And you can see by the headings that many of these deal specifically with areas of critical infrastructure uh, that are vital to our economy. I'm going to talk uh, most recently about one of our activities on unmanned aircraft systems. And I should add, in many cases, these collaboratives are convened at the request of a federal government agency. So in 2017, we convened our Unmanned Aircraft Systems Standards Collaborative. It's all about coordinating and accelerating the development of the standards and conformance programs need to facilitate the safe integration of UAS or drones into the national airspace system with an eye on international coordination and adaptability. 
We worked very closely with the Federal Aviation's uh, Office of UAS Integration and ultimately some 400 individuals from over 250 organizations contributed their expertise. Our focus was on supporting the growth of the UAS market with emphasis on civil, commercial, and public safety applications. The deliverable from this was a comprehensive roadmap that describes the current and desired future standardization landscape for UAS. We've published two versions, most recently in June of 2020. And this document identifies 71 gaps where there is no published standard that exists to, ident to address a particular issue under discussion. And I bring this up because it's possible that something similar could be done in the area of space standards. We have been in discussion with uh, stakeholders in the commercial space industry sector for over a year. In January of this year, we convened a meeting that drew over 40 organizations. There was some resistance as a result of that meeting to forming a collaborative and undertaking a road mapping exercise at this time for a fear that it would draw off resources that are needed to develop standards. We did a follow-up survey which indicated interest in ANSI holding an informative event on just what international standards exist or are in development to continue this dialogue. And we looked at what are the key priorities, what are some areas that might need greater coordination or are not being adequately addressed, or that could be good to discuss at such an ANSI meeting. And you see them on the slide here. We did further consultation with stakeholders and whittled the list down for at least an initial meeting to orbital debris mitigation, space situational awareness, and space traffic management. And right now we are working uh, to organize an event uh, later this year. So one of the things we will be looking at as well and that the standards community will have an eye on is what is happening in the policy arena. So some of the space policy drivers that folks will be familiar with include Space Policy Directive 2 on streamlining regulations related to the commercial use of space. And we know that FAA is working on revising its regulations on commercial space flight launch and re-entry operations. We also have Space Policy Directive 3 on national space traffic management, which talks about advancing SSA and STM as well as data sharing updating U.S. orbital debris mitigation standard practices and establishing new guidelines for satellite design and operation, especially in relation to licensing. It also directs several agencies to develop space traffic standards and best practices, including on-orbit collision avoidance support services. And we have the recent NAPA report, which identifies the Department of Commerce as the recommended lead agency on SSA and STM. This year, we had Executive Order 13905 on strengthening national resilience through responsible use of positioning, navigation, and timing services. This EO directs the Commerce Department to coordinate with other agencies in the development of PNT profiles. The idea here is to identify systems, networks, and assets that are dependent on PNT services, such as GPS, to detect disruption and manipulation of same and to manage the risk. NIST has work already underway in this regard. And the idea here is that subsequently agencies will work to incorporate these PNT profiles and services into their contracts with private sector critical infrastructure providers. Most recently in September, the president signed SPD-5 on cybersecurity principles for space systems. This provides guidance on protection of space assets and infrastructure from cyber threats, including the creation of space debris due to malicious activity. And it directs federal agencies to work with commercial companies to define and promote best practices, cybersecurity norms, and behavior. So to wrap up some of the key themes, the U.S. standard system is market-driven. Federal agencies should rely on private sector standards to the extent possible for both rulemaking and procurement. Standards should be performance-based and support innovation and policy drivers. The U.S. supports a multiple path approach to globally relevant standards. ANSI administers and coordinates the private sector system of standardization in the U.S. ANSI collaboratives bring the public and private sector stakeholders together to address national and global priorities and emerging technologies. And ANSI is engaged in a dialogue with the commercial space industry stakeholders in this regard.
Now, while standards exist for critical infrastructure across industry sectors that rely on satellites, it seems that the call to action coming from the administration is enhanced protection against cyber and physical threats to space systems and infrastructure. Here's my contact information, and with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Hello, my thanks to the Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center for inviting me to speak on the issue of commercial space standards and share some of my perspectives and our ongoing activities related to that. As we can all appreciate, space is absolutely integral to our lives, spanning all government and private sectors. The U.S. has a majority of spacecraft applications in the bow wave of large constellation spacecraft initiatives, an investment that will undoubtedly lead to socioeconomic applications and technological progress in agriculture, banking, navigation, communications, and earth remote sensing. But that also means that the U.S. must work to ensure the sustainability of space as a vital resource. Today, I'd like to share my perspectives on the role that commercial best practices can play in that important endeavor throughout the space life cycle. I want to start by mentioning that our U.S. standard strategy is in stark contrast with standards development initiatives in other countries with our emphasis on commercially driven standards. And given the level of achievement in the commercial spacecraft and SSA markets, it's easy to understand why this emphasis exists. Yet while good, this can make it a bit more difficult for the U.S. to develop a cohesive set of standards and regulations. It could potentially dilute U.S. participation in international consensus building processes, national government standards development activities, and U.S. engagement in helping to establish consensus space standards within standards development organizations, or SDOs, that have a well-established record of developing space standards, such as ISO and CCSDS. Unless carefully coordinated, it's also possible to have an unhealthy competition and divergence of codified best practices within SDOs. As if, as if this weren't challenging enough, the U.S. has different government standards for civil, military, and commercial sectors as captured by NASA, U.S. Air Force, and FAA. The point of the slide is to say that the U.S. approach, while being a fair and open tent in nature and promoting the space industry, does present some complex challenges that must be carefully managed. I think that we are on the cusp of understanding these challenges with multilateral liaison groups forming and information sharing being beginning to hopefully help us to address these challenges. Space has always been a challenging environment, perhaps never more so than today. Comprehensive space safety must address physical safety, communication safety, security, and space weather awareness. Physical safety includes avoiding launch and on-orbit collisions, minimization of human casualty or asset loss from spacecraft or debris reentry, and the long-term sustainability of the space operations environment. Communication safety includes minimizing the incidence and severity of radio frequency interference events. Cybersecurity is also of increasing performance. Space weather is, and always has been, a challenge to maintaining accurate space situational awareness and protecting the mission. And finally, I'd throw in there that the increasing scope and complexity of space activities presents challenges in and of itself because in today's new space era, we are flying many more spacecraft, introducing more debris, tracking more debris via commercial SSA systems, and better analytics than ever before. Today, our space activities are also rapidly changing, becoming increasingly complex and intricate. To illustrate this increasing complexity, plans have now been filed to build, launch, and operate over 107,000 spacecraft just within the next 10 years alone. This animation is based on the 107,000 spacecraft applications filed with the ITU and the U.S. Federal Communications Commission, or in a few cases announced in the media. While we fully realize that only a portion of these applications will yield an operational spacecraft, even if only 20% of these constellations are realized, we could easily see an active spacecraft population in the next decade that is 10 times larger than is flying today. This year alone, we could see the active space population nearly double. Cybersecurity is critically important. I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but I was privileged to be a co-panelist with Matthew Scholl, Chief of Computer Security at the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. I learned from his intervention that encryption standards that NIST develops protect not only U.S. government systems, but they are also widely embraced by commercial industry and our international partners. According to Matthew, space systems that use encryption ciphers and key management protocols have historically been built without the concept of cryptographic agility. While these are highly effective in protecting your data and businesses today, 
the near-term introduction of quantum computing will soon render them ineffective in the next eight to 10 years, he estimates. In order to avoid building space hardware that is technically obsolete before it is even launched, cryptographic agility should be viewed as a requirement. NIST is currently working to develop new suites of crypto technology. These new encryption standards will come online, he estimates, between 2022 and 2025. Now, the U.S. recently released its Space Policy Directive 5. It was on 4 September of this year. Consistent with Matthew's warnings, SPD 5 states that it is critical that cybersecurity measures, including the ability to perform updates and respond to incidents remotely, are integrated into the design of the space vehicle before launch, as most space vehicles in orbit cannot currently be physically accessed. Now, you might be wondering, in addition to those cybersecurity standards, what other international space standards already exist. Oftentimes, it's easy to see the treaties and guidance that have been developed by the United Nations Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. But note that these valuable documents are not actually standards. To find standards, we must turn to Standards Development Organizations, or SDOs, such as the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO, the Consultative Committee for Space Data Standards, or CCSDS, and others. Before we dig too deep into standards, we should discuss the need to develop consensus definitions of space-relevant terms. Terms must be standardized before we can employ them to author meaningful standards. And I've noted not more than once how many standards organizations struggle with terminology. I'm pleased to report that recently within the auspices of ISO, CCSDS, ASTM, and AIAA circles, we've been working to harmonize terminology. Specific to ISO and CCSDS, We've now identified an online portal for harmonizing and sharing our terms and definitions, and we are now actively working to align that content. ISO standards directly support and align with UN COPUS long-term sustainability guidelines, as denoted by the green filled cells in this table. The uh, way to interpret this is to look at subcommittee 13, where data messages are standardized, and subcommittee 14, where operational best practices and management practices are standardized. And these clauses out here denote the numbering used in the latest version, approved version of the long-term sustainability guidelines. Let's now examine where within the ISO framework space-related standards are developed. ISO Technical Committee 20, Subcommittee 13, which is also uh, shares a duality with Consultative Committee for Space Data Standards, develops comprehensive international space data message standards, sharing of space data such as orbital information, close approach parameters, tracking data, attitude data, reentry, and sensor pointing parameters, is enabled by the SC13 family of navigation working group standards. ISO Technical Committee 20, Subcommittee 14, develops comprehensive international standards codifying space systems best practices and expected norms of behavior. Now turning to the commercial side, the Commercially Self-Formed Space Data Association, or SDA, has been operational now for more than a decade. The SDA provides safety of flight services spanning all orbital regimes to 30 operators who collectively fly 680 spacecraft. It was formed to address perceived critical shortcomings in space safety, and it pioneered many of the data lake, crowdsourcing, and algorithmic approaches that many now understand to be fundamental to comprehensive space flight safety systems. The Space Data Center that we manage for the SDA provides geographic diversity, computational security, a robust legal framework, very high availability, ongoing forensics, data quality checks, and comparative SSA analyses. The SDA has also evolved to be one of the largest global clearinghouses for spacecraft operator data. The Space Safety Coalition is a coalition of the willing with like-minded companies and entities working to develop, publish, and maintain a set of orbit regime agnostic best practices for the long-term sustainability of space operations. You can find them at spacesafety.org. Through initiatives such as this and the Satellite Industry Association, the commercial space industry can make a positive impact on LTS by self-regulation in advance of space governance treaties, consensus guidelines, standards, and national regulations. At its inception, the Space Safety Coalition comprised 18 space organizations. Since that time, participation has more than doubled, with 45 space operators and relevant global industry stakeholders from 12 countries having endorsed this industry-led view of the current set of policies and best practices for space operation sustainability.
Participants represent a diverse set of organizations from across the global space enterprise, including foundations, industry associations, analytical service providers, legal firms, space insurers, on-orbit servicing, active debris removal companies, space situational awareness and STM service providers, launch providers, manufacturers, and spacecraft operators. Although non-normative, these best practices are generally applicable to all spacecraft regardless of physical size, orbital regime, or constellation size. In advance of treaties and regulations, signatories endorse and agree to promote and strive to implement SSC best practices to ensure the safety and commercial viability of space activities. Perhaps you're now wondering, with all of these existing international standards and commercial best practices, what remains to be done and how you can help, right? For one, we need forums just like this ISAC meeting to share and promote both international standards, industry best practices, and government approaches. Over time, we can achieve the steady incremental consensus building that's necessary to achieve true flight safety. Secondly, more work remains. This chart reflects Space Safety Coalition broad categories of best practices, with blue bars indicating current practices, yellow reflecting new prioritized development, and clear denoting additional planned content. But this is primarily a space industry-centric depiction of what's required for safety. Additional standards for inc increasing space efficiency also exist. In conclusion, we all know that we depend on, upon space capabilities in all facets of life. We face many challenges and threats, as well as growing complexity in space. Many commercial best practices, standards, and treaties already exist, as codified by industry associations, commercial industry, and government participation in SDOs and national regulations. But more needs to be done at all levels in a holistic manner, so that we don't have to find out the hard way just how much we rely upon that space. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dan and Jim. You uh, both brought up some uh, a lot of uh, really interesting uh, discussion, brought, kind of brought us up to speed on where things are. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, go into a little bit more depth in some of these areas and, and get your opinions on some of the uh, important issues that you both brought up. So you both mentioned the need for, for holistic approaches to uh, space governments and space standards, kind of looking at, um, you know, things as a whole. And both of you mentioned uh, the U.S. standard strategy and how it's multifaceted uh, and an open approach to standardization. So what do you see as the pros and cons of this kind of approach? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, first off, in terms of the need to be holistic in our approaches, I think uh, this spans the whole space enterprise uh, including space governance, space standards, space safety. Marlon, uh, I have the pleasure of working with for, for many years on space safety and orbital debris mitigation. And I certainly see the need for a holistic approach there. Um, we have an understandable legacy of stovepipe systems, I think, competition, exclusivity, insistence on using one's own algorithms and tools. Uh, even threat metrics. What what do you what metrics do you use to assess if something is a threat versus not? Um, and that has actually worked fairly well over the decades we've been in space. But we are coming to a time now where just the the launch tempo, the large constellations, the amount of debris not only that's uh, being put up there uh, and and resulting from collisions and explosions, but also our improved knowledge of what's up there mean that we need to have a lot better handle and, and streamline our whole operations. And so that's where this holistic notion comes from is we need to be crowdsourcing data. We need to pull in authoritative data from uh, whoever's willing to provide it and incorporate that into our overall construct. Um, now, uh, switching gears a little bit to the, the U.S. standard strategy, but actually not shifting that much, the, the standard strategy is a little bit like what I'm proposing we do with crowdsourcing in that there's a lot of best practices out there and standards from a, a bunch of different standards organizations and commercial industry. Uh, and, and the U.S. standard strategy, I think, has a strength of being able to support all those. So that's pretty good. It also promotes commercial industry. It's open tent. Uh, but I do think that um, that also 
for us, it uh, gives us challenges as, as a country in terms of figuring out who has what standards and best practices and how they all merge together. Uh, and and how do we come up with a cohesive picture of, of standards and best practices? That's, I think, part of our challenge with, with our country's approach. Over. Yeah, just to build on what Dan said, when I think of a holistic approach, I guess I think of space as being an, an ecosystem, right? Or you can think of it maybe as the life cycle of conducting a mission, right? If you're sending up a satellite, so you have your launch and re-entry uh, activities, you're putting the satellite into space, maybe you're trying to repair a satellite. You're on your way, you've got to avoid all of the orbital debris that is up there, and then you want to return the, the launch vehicle safely or make uh, plans to have it uh, be disposed of. So we're talking about sustainability. On top of that, sort of beyond the life cycle, you have all of the kind of horizontal issues like terminology, risk management, um, data sharing, that really cut across all of those different uh, phases. And so we need to look at that in total. I think that's what we mean by holistic. Um, doing it in a stovepipe kind of environment where people are not necessarily talking to each other obviously has clear disadvantages. Um, you just don't know what your your fellow standardizers uh, are doing. Um, in terms of the US standard strategy, Dan is absolutely right. It does add to the challenges that we as a country, kind of because of our, maybe our, it's part cultural, but the standard system in the United States has evolved in a decentralized way. And because of that, uh, you know, we've embraced this idea of having you can get a, a, a technically valid standard that may be globally relevant from any source. Um, and uh, this sometimes comes to the consternation of, of uh, our uh, allies in other parts of the world who might have a centralized government sort of run standards activity um, where everything is nicely put in one forum. Um, that's not how we are in the US, um, you know, ANSI for our, uh, our purpose, we're, we're the U.S. member of, of the Geneva-based uh, non-treaty organizations that I mentioned, ISO and IEC, uh, but then we have lots of U.S.-based standards developing organizations that have been around, in some cases, since the, the late 19th century or early 20th century and have been working very hard all that time to develop standards. Um, We've seen the emergence of consortia, and that also adds to the sort of the mix of, of players in this arena. So um, one of the points I tried to make in my presentation, again, was that we should be willing to look at all of these as potential places where we can get standards from. Ultimately, the choice of sort of where, um, whether it's a federal agency or commercial interest decides it wants to play is going to depend, I think, on their specific sector. Uh, as we move into sort of the discussion um, of, of industry sectors that are affected by satellites. Thanks. And, and both of you, um, both of your discussions bring up uh, 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 another point uh, that I'd like to look at is um, you, you noted the emphasis uh, in the U.S. on uh, commercial participation uh, versus uh, some other uh, areas. And uh, so g given that that's what we have here in the United States uh, with uh, a, a lot of participation from the commercial side, sometimes initiating, doing most of the initiating, um, what do you see as, um, uh, you know, some of the, the, the pluses and minuses of, um, you know, getting, being able to focus on the commercial side, getting the, the uh, standards from or, or the, the norms of behavior from commercial, and, and how does that play into the regulatory process uh, versus you know, what, uh, say, may go on in Europe where it's more government-driven? So, Jim, given your, your place at uh, ANSI, would you like to start with that? Sure. I, I think, you know, again, um, this idea that industry kind of drives 
the technology first and foremost, and, and again, oftentimes standards will, will sort of follow the technology, but we also at ANSI like to think of them as, as promoters of innovation because they reduce non-value added costs. But what you, I think where you wanna arrive at ultimately is uh, an environment where industry and um, public sector are, are working side by side and sharing best practices, sharing private sector know-how, um, that's really kind of what the, the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act is all about that I mentioned. And indeed, it does, uh, it does call for, in pretty explicit language, um, federal agencies must look to private sector standards wherever possible, um, as long as it's consistent with their mission um, or not inconsistent with their mission or otherwise impractical. So it's a very strong um, directive that, uh, you know, to, to do that and, and look to the private sector in lieu of developing government unique standards. And in fact, uh, you know, through NIST, agencies, uh, the Interagency Committee on Standards Policy, must report annually to Congress on their use of government unique standards in lieu of voluntary consensus, i.e. industry standards. Um, so as, as kind of a, an enforcement check on that. So you know, we're of the view that this is all good. Um, again, it's, it's helping to um, advance uh, you know, private sector knowledge and best practices maybe reduce all our tax dollars because you know the government is able to rely on what the private sector is doing. Thanks, Jim. Dan? Yeah, also uh, maybe to answer the question and a step back and look at a timeline here. Early days of space, it was the governments that were doing the, the space activities and, and uh, well into the 90s and so forth, dominating uh, that whole picture is changing, but uh, back then there were standards built by government entities, uh, actually different standards between NASA and FAA and uh, Air Force, for example, for space safety. Um, so, so we still today have some different standards at the government level, but like I said, the whole space picture is changing with new space and large constellations. Uh, commercial innovation uh, at a higher rate than it's ever been before in not just uh, space uh, uh, and operations, but also uh, space situational awareness and space traffic management capabilities and, and sensors and so forth. So I think we've evolved over to the place where um, the U.S. standard strategy uh, can show its strength, where we pull standards from commercial industry, as Jim mentioned. Uh, I think industry associations are playing a bigger role than they ever have been before with uh, Satellite Industry Association, the Space Safety Coalition, Space Data Association, and so forth, really bring, being able to bring in the commercial best practices. Um, and I would say those have been very effective uh, by being infused into, let's say, uh, what the FCC looks at or the interagency uh, group looks at when they develop the ODMSP. Uh, we've seen some of the ideas, the commercial ideas for how you make space safer and more efficient have infused themselves into those um, uh, agencies or, or entities at least to consider. Over. Yeah, thanks. And that, and that, leads right into uh, uh, makes me think about uh, another area that 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 uh, uh, is is clearly uh, along the lines we've been discussing is is how uh, how do you see dealing with um, the uh, standards versus the regulations how how those should interact because clearly with in some of the areas particularly in space safety um, you know there, there are going to need to be regulations how do you see um, the, the standards contributing to that, how, what, what do you see the balance between uh, industry self-regulation and, um, and, actual, and, and actual governmental regulation? So uh, Dan, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so maybe to answer the question, uh, I also wanna take a step back and look at how is the US standard strategy different from other countries? 
if we look at the EU and some of the countries in the EU and other countries, they are really active in developing a standard through some body. Um, typically, it's uh, for space, something like ISO or CCSDS. And they, they put their energy into that standard. And that standard ends up getting rolled into their regulations. Uh, now go to the US where we have this more multifaceted approach. We don't actually have a single standards body or standards document that's part of our regulations. So that's why you see, for example, in the FCC applications by different operators, they will say, yes, and we're going to adhere to the NASA standard or the FAA standard or, or other. Um, sometimes they adhere to multiple ones to be to be the most conservative. But again, we we introduce a level of complexity uh, by our multifaceted approach. So it has uh, pros and cons. Over. Yeah, I think um, I think it's a bi-directional relationship. Symbiotic maybe is is a way to put it. Um, and I'll give you the example I mentioned in my remarks about ANSI convening a collaborative on um, the standards and conformance uh, programs needed to put drones safely into the U.S. airspace for commercial purposes. Um, one particular policy issue in that is remote identification of drones when they're flying around at a low, a low altitude. And, um, you know, the, the industry has done what it can through the SDOs to develop a standard, but that standard is going to get modified as soon as FAA comes out with its final rulemaking on remote ID. So, um, so I think in some cases like that, where especially in a heavily regulated environment like space is going to be, um, you know, in terms of having commercial interests really accessing it, uh, this evolution, as Tim described, um, that is important. I would point out, um, you know, there is a website, standards.gov, uh, that missed toasts, and um, you can find the list of standards that are uh, referenced in the Code of Federal Regulations um, and, and, you know, incorporated by reference. ANSI also, um, ibr.ansi.org, I believe is the, is the URL, has uh, lists of standards. Again, this is general across industry sectors. It's it's not specific to, to the space sector, but um, you know those kinds of resources can provide information about where voluntary industry standards make their way eventually into the regulatory framework. Yeah, and Marlon, I, I did want to add and just to note. A lot of people think of organizations such as CCSDS, which is space agencies, 11 space agencies in the world, as being a, a basically a government standards development place. And they think of ISO oftentimes as being a, a government thing. I want to point out there is active commercial uh, participation in those bodies as well, as you know. Um, and so commercial industry has been uh, very active in developing standards, not only there, but also in industry associations. Over. Yeah, and, and you bring up a really good point there, too. Um, so, you know, given the importance, as you both discussed, about this, this collaboration and, and the fact that it can be a real advantage uh, for the U.S. and potentially for, for other, other uh, countries as well, um, how do you see, um, what, what approaches do you see would be useful in encouraging the commercial industry to participate in some of these um, uh, these uh, standards development organizations to, to really get the benefit and interaction of both both the commercial and the government. So do you want to go ahead, Dan, since you started talking about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's actually a challenge. I'm, I'm the head of delegation for subcommittee 14 that, that works on space standards within technical committee 20, a, a mouthful of, of technical jargon. But the point is that as a U.S. head of delegation, I worry a lot about finding uh, commercial and government people to participate in the standards development process. That is made a little bit more complex, I think, uh, in my job, 
of finding people who can support because we don't have an identified uh, single place to develop standards. Uh, people say, well, you're developing standards for ISO or CCSDS, but um, I have trouble, for example, with the ISO rule that one country gets only one vote. And you look at the US with its decades long of uh, space experience and, and space activity, and all the commercial companies, perhaps 85% of large constellation applications come from the US. And, you, and, and those operators may say, well, wait a minute, we, we need to develop standards that reflect our US activities and our, our best practice. But here's an organization where I only have one vote for the whole country, not just one organization, but the whole country. So that leads to this natural split where people want to maybe use different S standards development organizations or SDOs, different paths to codify their best practices. That's where in uh, industry associations are helping as well. But, you know, writ large, um, it does again introduce complexity and, and it can make some of the standards from bodies like ISO and CCSDS not as heavily used and not incorporated into regulation as much because of it. Over. Yeah, I think it, um, again, I think it depends on the industry sector, right? So just take agriculture for an uh, example. Um, I know historically they have been, uh, as an industry, very much coalesced around doing standards work. I'm getting a little background noise, um, but um, the, um, Conversely, you have like the ICT sector, right? And they also, I mean, the US there has a leadership role in that we run the secretariat of that committee internationally. It's a joint committee of ISO and IEC. So a lot of it really depends on where kind of industry coalesces around which SDO they, they just feel is making the most sense to, um, to, to your point, Marlon, to be able to I guess, comply with or address uh, the, rec the requirements that they're gonna be uh, forced to meet. I mean, I sat through the, the recent FAA ComStack meeting and there was basically a decision at the end of that meeting uh, or a recommendation, I guess it is, that um, for purposes of human space flight and, and launch and re-entry, um, ASTM's F-47 committee is the place that uh, is suggested to develop those standards. And part of the argument is because that is going to be somehow better attuned with um, meeting the requirements that are gonna be laid down by FAA. So um, I think ultimately, again, it's, it's sort of this dialogue between industry and the regulators as to where they wanna participate, where they're gonna get the most bang for their buck. Yes. And, and Ahead, if I yeah. could also, if I could also pull on that thread a little bit too, um, you know, some people are, and some SDOs, I think, uh, perceive that we shouldn't have duplication of effort in terms of standards. Uh, my experience with ISO is I have a role, and I think it's a good role, to work to not only develop standards at the international consensus level with all these uh, member countries but also to uh, locate and promote U.S. Uh, developed standards and U.S. commercial best practice as standards that get proposed to ISO. So I, in my opinion, this, this will lead to duplication of standards, but it's really to be encouraged. We want to try and have our country's uh, standards and best practices reflected in the international community as well. Uh, so over. And, and that was a, a wonderful lead into the next thing I was thinking about listening to both of you talk, both about the difference between the way the U.S. works and a lot of other countries, uh, the, the intrinsically sort of international nature of space, uh, and, um, you know, that, that brings up a lot of these questions about how should we go about doing international collaboration? Um, um, you know, and you started talking about that, that Dan. What do we need to be doing? How, how much of it do we need to be doing? Uh, do we need to be doing in particular areas? 
Uh, you know, as, as you pointed out, Jim, some sectors are, are, it's things like that are more important than others. So uh, I'd like to get your, both of your thoughts on that. So, um, uh, Jim, do you want to start there? Well, I think, um, you know, when you take a body like CCSDS, I mean, clearly that's going to be a draw, right? Because it's got the space agencies actively committed to involvement. Um, and they're all coming at it from the perspective of the requirements that they have in their own country. So maybe that's an easy one. It, it gets harder, I think, when you have, and, and you know, to Dan's point, there is, sure, there's competition between these groups who are developing standards. I'd like to think of it that it's a, a healthy competition um, with everybody trying to get ultimately to the best technically valid standard. Uh, years ago, we used to hear the, the, the mantra, one standard, one test accepted everywhere. Uh, I'm not sure that that's happened in, in <laughs> many, if any, sectors, but it's certainly something to aspire to. Um, so, you know, it, again, I, I think the driver here is going to be partly dictated by, in the case of a regulator, where they see uh, the greatest value, and in, in the case of industry, sort of maybe in parallel, you know, where they see the value. Yeah, I'd also add, um, I think we're on the cusp of getting a better handle on things. And I'm looking at Jim's video on screen here as I say this. Uh, Jim started a, a meeting on 29 January of this year to bring together standard or organizations and, and government entities so that we could start a dialogue to exchange. Here's what we're working on. Here's our active work program. Here's the the areas where we see gaps and we need to develop standards in the future. Uh, it was kind of a whirlwind meeting, it was very quick, but I think it was a good harbinger of, of what we need to be doing, which is opening up this dialogue. I note also uh, ASTM is, has proposed a liaison working group so that uh, different entities, ISO representation, CCSDS, ASTM, SAE, and others, can come together and share what they're working on. Um, so I think that's, uh, in answer to your question, I think that's a very important part of how we start to address this uh, collaboration and exchange. I also point to the CCSDS organization, which as, as Jim mentioned was, uh, you know, it's space agencies and how can you not be attracted to that? Not only because of what they represent, but also because they have some funding. Uh, standards development typically does not get a lot of funding, but we found that uh, with with uh, CCSDS, for example, they fund a platform called the SANA Registry, uh, which which we now are looking to use as a place to harmonize our terminology for standards development. Uh, definition of reference frames, timing systems, uh, coordinate uh, frames, element sets. Uh, and so that money that comes along with that is, is very beneficial, even though it's, it's not a lot of money. Um, and I would say also, again, that at the, at the ISO level, for example, some of the things that maybe at, in the U.S. level we're looking to ASTM to focus on, like human spaceflight, we now have some of our P member countries uh, like Russia who are asking for human spaceflight to be a part of the ISO um, standards content and work program. So again, even if inside of our country, we try and keep things kind of separate and figure out where we're gonna do things. Um, when you get to the international level, you can't necessarily control uh, as as one country, one vote, what gets work done. So uh, we're going to have to accept and figure out how to fuse all these activities together. Over. Well, and if I could just uh, build on what, what Dan said, I, I think the issue of standards participation is a challenge that all SDOs face. Dan is facing it in, in, in ISO. I know ASTM, I mentioned before, is facing it. 
Um, and it's especially so in an, in an area of emerging technology um, because so much of the attention of the industry is focused on compliance with whatever regulations exist, but also getting their technology out and, and, and up. Um, the other thing I think is that, and I appreciate the, the plug, I mean, what we've tried to do as ANSI in sort of this bringing this idea of holistic look at the issues together was, was really through our collaborative just kind of having that conversation. You know, we started out talking about the U.S. standard strategy. Do we have a U.S. space standard strategy? Should we have one? And what would it look like? Um, so that I think is, is kind of a question that we're, we're kicking around right now. over. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and that, that leads me to another question now that you're talking about where we go in space. I mean, I, obviously, as we we're discussing and everybody's seen, um, space space is, is changing very quickly. The activities that are going on just at a faster pace than it's ever been going before. Um, you know, there are, are some, some areas of uh, space standards where there's been more activity. There are areas where that are brand new that nobody's done anything in. So what do you all see as, you know, the areas that where there's been more work, uh, the areas that need work, and, and what can we learn from uh, the places where there has been work in space uh, that would help uh, in developing standards and going forward in the, in the new areas that are just coming up? Yeah, I'll, so I'll start. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I was participated in a NATO uh, series of meetings this uh, yesterday and today. And we talked about the importance of data fusion. That goes along with what I mentioned earlier in our Q&A session here about the need to exchange our data and authoritative data and bring it all together. And that cannot happen unless we get standards in place that support that data fusion. So formats and content, metadata and all that, data lake models and that, so that, that uh, can all happen as it, as it should. So I think uh, there's certainly gaps there in some areas, but I also noted in just uh, participating in those meetings, there is um, a lack of awareness, I think, in some of the standards that already exist. Uh, and this happens, I, I observe it even more at the policy level, rather at the technical level, uh, that, that people aren't aware and, and think that we have to go off and spin up some new thing and develop some new standard from scratch. I would say, like, if you look at message standards from CCSDS, they've been around for a long time. They're well supported. It's a really good group of folks building those. I think, uh, to, to kind of tie this off, I think that in the U.S., with all the new government activities for space traffic management and FAA and uh, integrated airspace, perhaps, we need to be careful to make sure we're aware of what already exists before we go run off and build something new. ANSI has been coordinating many different SDOs for a long time. Uh, they need to be part of the discussion. This needs to be part of the discussion and the SDOs, obviously. Over. Yeah, we, um, we've put together, you know, what's basically a, an ongoing working draft, a living document, if you will, a standards activity that we're aware of. Um, in some cases, it's just the organization. In other cases, where it's easy to get the information, like the detailed work programs that some of the SDOs have, um, so that's a that's a start, and it, there seems to be um, great interest in in just that, uh, if nothing else, and kind of keeping apprised of it. I mean, I do think to sort of echo what Dan said, you know, all of the policy drivers that I mentioned, I think, are informing the discussion, right, about what the priorities are, because this is what this is what the government is is telling us are the priorities if you're going to be able to uh, utilize space on a commercial basis. I think to try and tie it back in also to the theme of, of this conference, as I understand it, is, you know, I don't know to what extent all of those different industry sectors, whether it's, you know, banking and finance or environmental monitoring, um, you know, transportation, search and rescue, 
that the extent to which they rely on satellites and have they really given due consideration to potential disruptions um, that might occur to to carrying out you know to to safeguarding the infrastructure in the event of some sort of um, you know malicious activity or or accident or what have you. So that's what I'm hearing as kind of uh, really a call to action at a at a macro level in terms of identifying what the priorities are. Over. Jim, and that that really brings up a a good question. I think is along the theme of this this meeting as well as this this. Um, issue of, of the interplay between safety aspects of standards, security focused standards and, and others and, and how that should work. Um, and, and particularly given say your experience with, with like the UAS where clearly that's also an issue, uh, what, what insights do you have uh, related to this, that the balancing these things um, in space? It's it's tricky for sure. I mean, one of the topic areas on UAS was, um, you know, counter UAS, like basically what mitigations are do government agencies have at their disposal when we do see a drone flying um, around an airport um, without authorization? Uh, what do you do about that? And so, um, you know, a lot of the stuff I think is um, is kind of anecdotal, but I, I think you know you have to you have to build on um, what already has been done, as has been pointed out, and think about again what is the specific purpose of of a mission uh, in terms of identifying you know what those what those areas are. Dan. Uh, nothing to add. That's good response, I think. All right. I, I have to say this has been um, really, really interesting. Uh, there, there's a lot to think about here. Uh, I think uh, you've both laid out some some really important issues in terms of of where we need to to be thinking about where we need to be going, um, what needs to happen. Uh, clearly, with as much activity as going on in space right now, uh, I think the, the more we do sooner rather than later, the better off everybody's going to be. Uh, you know, it is a really exciting time for space, and, and it would be great to be able to facilitate making that happen all the safer, all the faster. Uh, and I think this is definitely a way to do it. So thank you both, Dan, Jim, really appreciate it. Thank you, Marlon. Yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure to be on here.